Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Williamstown First Baptist Church. Uh, glad you could be with us this morning. Uh, we're going to begin this morning with our call to worship. Let me put my glasses on. <laughs> our, uh, our call to worship today uh, is a familiar verse. It's from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us a world filled with light, for giving us your word, your sure word, about who we are and where we came from and how we got here. Father, we just ask as we gather here today that we would be mindful of all that you've done for us and through us and all that you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Bless our time this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> For those of you who are able, will you please join me in our first hymn this morning, Give Thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given. Jesus Christ is Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given. Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say i am strong let the poor say cycle and so they won't be available until next month uh, but this is for december january and february uh, we do want to pray for uh, some a number of things you'll see them in the prayer request they're highlighted uh, one is for Char, uh, Char 2, as she said this morning. Uh, and please pray that she has a successful pacemaker installation December 8th, not this coming week, but the week after. Baptist in Dothan, Alabama, uh, as we go forward. Uh, the one under that is the one that I've placed there. Uh, someone I had breakfast with, uh, 22 sons with wives and, daughter and family, so please keep them in prayer. He's And continue praying for the town family, uh, for God's comfort um, after Nancy's passing. Uh, there will be a service here on December 17th uh, at 10 o'clock. We should make note of this morning. Yeah, sure, Barb. Yep. Remind me of his name, Barb? Roger. And Amber, okay. Coming home, traveling. So please, uh, safety for them and for Billy and John as they're moving. So, and for packing. <laughs> Bless your heart. Okay. Well, we have others here. Please keep uh, Dan Lamprin 
and his wife Kathy in prayer up at Florida Baptist, and has been there for quite a while now. Uh, faithful servant. Uh, remember your Bible study, uh, reading through the Bible. Would encourage you to consider it for next year if it's not something you've done. As Elena uh, said this morning, uh, someone asked, how come I knew the Bible? Uh, partly because I read it. And that's no small thing. And what we need to remember, I've read it for a long time, but this is a living word. Uh, as I said, it's not an academic book that you can memorize and know. It's an ongoing conversation between you and God the Father. And he speaks to you. And if you ask, he will apply the word to your circumstance, whatever that might be. And he will help you grow in a knowledge of him that will enable you to navigate this world. Uh, so I would encourage you to consider that. Um, and after you read it for a number of years and you commit yourself to that, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember uh, at times you need to defend your faith in Christ. And he will bring things to your mind that you will be surprised at. Uh, so please do uh, consider that. And also... Uh, continue to pray for uh, Eva, who's been moved uh, uh, up in uh, Bennington now. She's at the Center for Living and Rehabilitation, uh, as well as Laura. Uh, a long time they've not been able to be independent, and we know how important that is. Uh, please keep them in your prayers. They're still faithful servants, even where they're at. Okay, let's bow our heads. Uh, Father, we do pray for uh, Barb's uncle Roger. We know he's ready and willing to be with you uh, and that you've kept him with us. And so we pray that you bless his time. Uh, let him know you have purpose for what you're doing. And may he be a light and salt, even at this latter stage of his life, that others might see his faith and be challenged uh, to consider Christ as their Savior as well that they might have such peace at departing. Uh, we do pray for Christopher, Ashley, and Amber for safe travels for all the college students. And, uh, as they're moving, give them strength and wisdom uh, for that. Uh, help them, Lord, uh, to be efficient in what they do and to be wise, uh, to know what they need and uh, what they can discard. Uh, we pray for the Rickers family and the Town family, uh, for Karen's family, uh, for a woman we know, uh, Debbie, who lost her husband a year ago, uh, and for a woman named Kathy, who lost her husband within the last month, and their family. So many, Lord, uh, we know how painful that is to lose someone that we love that is a part of us. We pray that your spirit would reach out, that would comfort them, comfort them turn their hearts and minds to you, Cause them to seek your comfort, and Lord, be found of them, we pray, and provide that. Encourage them during this time, but also uh, during the weeks and months ahead, uh, knowing that it will remain difficult for a time. Uh, help us not to forget them in this next year or two, but to continue to reach out and comfort them. Uh, we pray for the services this morning. We pray for Dan. Uh, up at Florida Baptist. Uh, we pray for all of those in the area. We include our own. We pray that your spirit would be at work, having brought people to hear your word, uh, or providing that it be heard at some point on YouTube or whatever medium is being used. We thank you for those mediums. Pray that they're used wisely and not in place of in-person worship, where we can experience the fellowship with the saints that is so necessary to our growth, to our comfort, uh, Lord, and to our witness, uh, we pray that your spirit would speak powerfully, uh, that he would draw people to the pulpits to hear, that he would be in the pulpit to speak, and that he would build your kingdom. Uh, we pray that we'll be part of that and that you'll give wisdom to all of the churches to know how to disciple, to mentor, to love in your name. Uh, that the congregations in this area might grow. Uh, raise up workers, Lord, for the harvest. You have told us that we ought to pray for this, and so we do this morning. 
And we pray for that, especially here in Williamstown, where you've placed us. We pray that you would pour your spirit out the various streets and homes in this community, include the college and the dormitories, on the professors, on the staff, everyone in this community. We pray that your spirit would work and draw people to you, convert souls, cause them to seek you and to love your word. Uh, and Lord, bring them to your churches that we might celebrate together, uh, that we might magnify the name of Christ and then tell his name to all those around. And let your spirit bring that word, that name, uh, not only to this community, but let it spread as it did in the time of the apostles. Uh, starting in Jerusalem, And we pray that it would begin here and that you would bring revival, bring awakening uh, to your church and to your people. Uh, Lord, bless now as we worship you, make it acceptable in your sight, uh, cause our praises to be acceptable, cause our fellowship uh, later on to be acceptable uh, and joyful as we know and remember what Christ has done for us. In his great name we pray, amen. Please stand and we'll praise our Lord. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God. I come, I come, just as I to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood land of God I come, I come, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Just as I am. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God. Just as broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate 
to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood and arms. Praise God, just as I am, just as I am. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This corn out and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless babe This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. He lay, light of the world by darkness slain, when bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his. And he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. Or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand The splendor of a king clothed in majesty the 
Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands. And time is his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the God had three in one Father, Spirit, Son Lion and the Lamb Lion and the Lamb how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our God. Our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Uh, please be seated. And we'll turn this morning to the Gospel of John. Very familiar words in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Uh, that's found on page 886 in the Pew Bibles, uh, or in your own Bible. And... We have, uh, we're lighting an Advent candle, and the candle is reluctant to stand up, so if you see me leap to the front of the pulpit, <laughs> that's why. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Put some wax in there. See, someday in heaven... Someday in heaven, you see, all the candles will just stand upright. You won't have to worry about whether they fall over in the middle of a message about the light of the world. Uh, and so all of these things work together as God always does for good. Uh, an example of how difficult it is for us to stand on our own uh, in this world. 
even though we are now considered the light of the world and how much we need Christ. And so perhaps with a little wax, we'll see what happens. So this morning, as we turn towards Advent with the lighting of the wreath, of course, uh, something that's done in many congregations uh, as we turn our hearts towards Christmas. Of course, as Christians, every day is Christmas. We celebrate the coming of our Lord every day and his meaning. Uh, This is an opportunity now when others in the greater world are turning theirs uh, to something that's commonplace for ourselves to speak to them, uh, to point them to the true light, to the Christ, to the baby as the eternal God. Uh, Not just something that's a romantic notion, but something that's the most necessary thing in everyone's life to recognize exactly who this baby is, why he came, and why I should come and I should adore him. Uh, And so, praise God. Uh, So we'll remind ourselves, and hopefully so that we might remind others exactly who Christ is uh, during this season. Uh, So let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, as with all things, we need your blessing, your help. We need your spirit to uh, direct everything that will be said in these next minutes as uh, we attempt to apply this text to our lives, to understand it as you intended. We pray your spirit would do that for us. Um, At the same time, Lord, not only guide the words, but open hearts. uh, For we know that no matter how beautiful uh, the rhetoric, It will have no impact at whatsoever unless your spirit opens our hearts, allows us to receive that good seed. Make us good soil this morning and cause there to be a fruit of righteousness, a harvest of righteousness uh, come because of what's said here. And we pray and we always pray for the sake of our Lord's kingdom and his name. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Very familiar passage uh, written by John uh, some 40 years at least. After he knew Christ, after Christ came into the world, and he begins this, with the intention of talking about verse 14. Verse 14 says, and the word that's referenced there in those verses, the word became flesh and tabernacled, dwelt among us. Tabernacled, the same word that would be used to describe what Jesus did with the Israelites Tabernacle, God with us, Emmanuel, walking with us, living with us. And so for anyone who heard this, especially those who knew the Torah, the Old Testament, we call it, the Jewish people call it their Bible, it would ring with familiar words, in the beginning, in the beginning. And whereas the other gospel writers in talking about Jesus started at a later point in his life, referencing his birth, perhaps, into this world as Luke does, talking about the birth as Matthew does, talking about the things that happened when he was brought to be dedicated, circumcised, 
John goes all the way back to in the beginning. In the beginning. I heard a young fellow say that he loved the idea that God was a baseball fan. In the big inning. (laughs) In the beginning was the word. This individual who in chapter 14 became flesh and dwelt among us was in the beginning. And in the beginning, in the very first verses, we see in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, which was our call to worship, we see that it was in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so John ends up in the same place, talking about this individual, the light shining in the darkness, and the darkness not overcoming it, and in Genesis talking about God's command that there be light, and there was light. Which begs a question, at least it did for me. We have a couple of people in our Sunday school who say they ask a lot of questions. Well, I understand that, because so do I. Because as I see in Genesis that darkness was over the face of the deep, I want to ask, where did the darkness come from? (laughs) Why am I asking that question? Well, because as darkness is defined, both by Merriam-Webster and in a Greek dictionary, it's the absence of light. Seems pretty common sense, right? the absence of light. But God is light. Scripture tells us that God is light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, John would say in his first letter, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So, Where did the darkness come from? Jesus, we're told, dwells in unapproachable light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. See, the light of the world. And one thing this should point to us too, as we look at it, is that Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, stand outside the world. There are those who would make him coterminous with the world, pantheism. God would be in the trees. God would be in the dogs. God would be in everything. Not so. God stands outside the world. It was the world that it was angels, that it was Satan himself who rebelled. We're not told. We have questions for things. We'd like answers. And until we get to glory, we won't know. But we do know that the world, at that point in time, in the beginning, in that point, there was darkness over the face of the deep. And darkness in this world we are familiar with. Everywhere we're told that the world is in darkness. All you have to do is read the paper. Every time I bring up BBC or CNN on my phone, there's been a shooting someplace in America. Young people are depressed. Young people are hopeless. Young people who have the most reason to have hope. Everywhere in America there is darkness everywhere in the world as we see not only battling in the Ukraine, we see it around the world in Yemen, 
I saw that Venezuela might get another chance now this morning. But everywhere there is battling. There are people rising up against governments, rising up even in China. There are riots going on at the moment because of COVID lockdown, that there's darkness in the world. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And it's from this darkness that Jesus has come to deliver us from. In Colossians, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Peter says we have been called out of darkness and even prophesied in Isaiah and fulfilled by Christ's coming, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And so there is darkness. Darkness is in the people as well. For most of us who are saved at a later time in life, we can tell you about darkness. We can tell you about darkness, and we would tell you with tears in our eyes if you pressed us. We know that at one time, as Paul says in Ephesians, you were darkness. Represented by the fact that we were dead in our sins. And that's why Paul would exhort people to let's cast off the work of darkness. And that Paul in his testimony in Acts said that he was called to open the eyes of people so they might turn from darkness to light. We are in darkness. And everything that we do until the coming of the light, until the Lord speaks into our souls, is darkness. And the answer has to come from outside of us because it takes light to drive away darkness and I have no light in me. I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. And so it was so in Genesis. And we see there in Genesis that the Spirit of God but the Spirit of God was over the darkness. See, there's darkness because God permits it to be. In Isaiah, there's a a verse that you will have to meditate on long and hard because it tells us that God himself creates darkness. Him who has no darkness within him, in whom there is no darkness, Creates light, creates darkness, creates evil, creates calamity. It has to be so because God creates all things. And if he didn't create it directly, he allowed it. And you say, how can that be? And I say that if you look at the life of Joseph, God allowed that darkness in his life and then one day sent the light, called him out of the dungeon and made him emperor And so God allows it, but he's in control of it just as he was with Job. Job walked uprightly. What happened to Job? To give a testimony to you and I that God is in control of everything in our lives. Have you lost family? Have you lost businesses? Have you lost your own health? You see all these things in the book of Job, and you see that it's God's hand that's allowing it. The Spirit of God, God is hovering over the darkness in Job's life. But there comes a moment in time at the end of that book, not Job's life, when God said, let there be light. Let there be light. And so in the Old Testament, the light was the spoken word, the command of God. Let there be light. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. 
And one day we see in the book of Revelation that we'll return to that moment in time when we need no other light except God. And so before creation, God, who is light, existed. At the end, after everything is ended, (laughs) terminated, I know there's a word in there, But if we look at the book of Revelation, the sun and moon will be no more. The sun shall be, the lamb shall be the light thereof. The city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of the Lord gives it light. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. So we're moving between God, who existed eternally in that state as being light, to God existing eternally is light with no darkness evermore. And we are in between, and God has allowed there to be darkness in our life. If you look in the 119th Psalm, there are about five verses on facing pages that tell us that we are blessed in our affliction. Blessed because we come to know God, come to trust God that God is introducing into our lives by his sovereign power, pain. We see in relationships that pain is required in order for a relationship to grow. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And sometimes during these last few years, we've had iron sharpens iron in our conversation with others as we talked about whether to wear masks, whether to get vaccinated, whether we should vote for this president or not. We've had conflict, and yet it sharpens us. It enlightens us, and we become more like Christ. God brings conflict into our lives for a purpose. You say, Chuck, why would God do that? I don't know. But if you look at the book of Acts, I can see that God does this with his son. He allowed the darkness. Jesus said in the garden, this is the time of darkness. And they took and they crucified the Lord of glory, the kindest, gentlest, most loving human being that ever lived. They crucified him, and then you read in the book of Acts, it was according to God's plan, his predetermined purpose. And so God uses darkness in our lives. And he wants us to remember that he controls the darkness. And so in the book of Genesis, there was light, and it says there was morning, evening and morning, day one. And so every day when we get up, we ought to think of Genesis. We ought to be reminded of this message, that God is over the darkness, and yet he allows it. And it coexists with light until the time of revelation when there will be no more need to be reminded that he's over darkness. And in the book of Revelation, there will be light Pure light, always light. And so God wants us to remember. And so that word was given on that date, but it was allowed to coexist and it has coexisted. But now in our time, he doesn't not send only the spoken word, he sends the living word. We see that here in John. In the beginning, was the word leading to the word tabernacling with us. And we have here an expression of who that living word is. We have the eternality of the word. In the beginning was. He was already there at the beginning of creation. He existed eternally. The word was with God. And so he's a separate personality in the beginning. Yes, God is one, as Deuteronomy tells us. But there's a plurality of persons within that unity. And we see that here 
because we're told that the word, and the word is identified later in the chapter as Jesus was with God and so separate from him. We see in the beginning that the spirit was hovering over the waters. And so we see that there's father, son, and spirit. And so in the beginning was the word eternal. In the beginning, the word was with God. Personality and the word was God. Was God in the beginning. And so equality. We talked about that this morning. Because even though Jesus in the hierarchy of the Trinity, subjects himself to the Father. As we looked at in Corinthians one day, Jesus, when everything is subjected to him, he will then hand it to his Father and once more voluntarily submit his will to his Father's will. So yes, Jesus is equal, but in that hierarchy, he is submissive. But he is still God. And then to repeat it, just to make sure we get it, he, he was in the beginning with God, separate as, P, as a person in the beginning. And the creation that's talked about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? Verse 3 of John, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. A statement that's made in a positive sense and then in a negative sense, so that you can be sure that what John is intending, that there's nothing in this world, nothing in our universe or cosmos that has been created that is not there because of God's will. One of my favorite Psalms, I didn't put it in my notes, but it comes to, comes to mind is 148 because I hear people talking about the devil being equivalent with Jesus, being equivalent of God. Psalm 148 tells us that all things were created by him. Praise the Lord, it begins. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights now gives us a list of who ought to praise him. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Why should all these praise him? Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And so every single angel, and Satan is an angel, demons are angels, bad angels, are created beings. And they ought to give praise because they too, all things were created. Jesus stands outside of time. Time itself is a construct of the creation. In the eternal period, there will be no time. There will be no alarm clocks, as best I know. I hope not. It wouldn't be heaven. You see, outside of time, and the way it's constructed in the Greek, it even makes it more impressive. It says, there was not anything made that was made, not one. Not one thing. Everything. And so this spirit that's hovering over creation is in control of everything, even the darkness. The darkness can go no further than the light permits. And so it was all created by him, and in this word was life, and that life was the light of men. When everything was created, it was inanimate. And God breathes the breath of life And we're told in Scripture that if he takes away life, takes away that breath, they perish. And if you've lived long enough to see someone expire, it's at that moment they expire their last breath. And so in him is life. 
he animates. But that life is more than that. It's also light. J.I. Packer calls this the word animating. Nothing lives in the world from, apart from the sustaining power of the word. And in giving life, he gives light too. Intimations of God. Everything that we know is because it's been revealed to us. Our ability to know our life has been given to us by the word. I live, I breathe, I have my being because of Christ. And if I was living in darkness, now he has come into my life. But there's one more thing we need to know about the light, and that's chapter chapter 1, verse 5. And it's a marvelous thing because it tells us the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That word has two meanings. Has not comprehended it, has not overcome it. And if you've known someone once you're a Christian who remains in darkness, you know that both are true. First of all, they can't comprehend the light that is in your heart. They can't comprehend Christianity. And that's affirmed in Corinthians. We're told the natural man does not accept the things of God. We need the spirit. We need the light to be able to understand. And so darkness does not comprehend anything to do with light, but neither does it overcome it. When you turn on a light, As long as that light's on, the darkness is overcome. Elena got me a light you can wear on your head if you walk. You know, of course, I'm old school. I prefer to walk in the dark and dodge the cars myself. And so even though I've had it for three years, I've never worn it. Except last night, as I'm walking back, I kick something on the sidewalk and I thought, well, it didn't kick back, so I guess it wasn't alive, but maybe I should turn on the light. (laughs) And that's why scripture says that uh, anyone in darkness stumbles over things, and he doesn't know what he stumbled over. And why Jesus said, let them alone. They be blind men. And blind men leading blind men both go into the ditch. You see, And so, light. And Jesus has called us out of that light. The first thing he did was he called us out of darkness. He chose us, Peter said. And we saw this when we just did Peter. He chose us, made us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he called us, but we had no power to go there ourselves. So what did he do next? The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, let there be light, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so not only did he call us, but he enabled us to be light. He shone that light into our dark hearts. As much as he did in Genesis in the beginning, in the beginning of my spiritual life, Jesus said, let there be light. And then his word became a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, because then I had the headlamp on. I could see. Even worse, I could see in the mirror. It's a marvelous thing when you walk into your bathroom at night and there's no lights on. You can look in the mirror and imagine yourself to be the most handsome, most beautiful person that ever existed. And then you turn on the light. And then after your wife hears a crash and comes in and picks you up off the floor, the first thing she does is turn off the light. (laughs) 
Because when I have light, I can see truth. Before I have light, I can't see truth. One time I was selling light bulbs with the Lions Club. I went into a bar early in the day. It was not selling liquor at that time, although I wouldn't have cared at that point in my life. But at 10 o'clock in the morning in a bar, you look around and you see the cracks and you see the stains, you see the dirt, you see all these things. If you go into that bar in the middle of the night when darkness reigns, you'll see none of those things. They will not be apparent without the light. And see, that's what happens when the light comes into our hearts. It begins to shine in our hearts. It's like God takes a lamp and he walks through every single room in our heart. He walks through the living room, the bedroom, the kitchen. We have a closet that's locked. It doesn't matter. You see, because the light shines. But he comes and he delivers us, Colossians said, from the domain of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And so now, because the light dwells in us, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He's shown in our hearts. He called us out of darkness. He commands us no longer to walk according to the darkness that we used to walk in. He commands us to be the light of the world. And do what? Let our good works shine. Let our light shine that people see our good works. See our good works and glorify their Father in heaven. And so now you and I are in this world. God has allowed there to be darkness, and there will be darkness even in churches. He's allowed us to have to deal with darkness, and he's challenged us. He's giving us his light, the light of his word, the light of each other that he's placed in us that we can fellowship with and have conversation with, correct each other with. If your brother sins against you, go to him, rebuke him. If he doesn't hear you, take someone else. He's given us each other so that we can walk in the light. And we need each other's help to do that. And so now we're supposed to be the light of the world. And because the light is not who we are naturally, because it's emanating from us, because the light ought to emanate from every pore in our body, we know it's not from us, just as a light bulb knows. It's not the source of light. And so we point people to that source. Because I was darkness, I could not create light. It was God who called me out, gave me the light, and told me to be the light. And I'll be the light until that day the Lord calls me home. And that day is not that far away. He says, you're the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, for the day is far spent. And as we look around us, we see that in our world. We see the darkness seems to be winning. Only if God allows it. And if there's one person in this world who's light, it will overcome darkness. He will overcome darkness. Not only in the world, maybe it's in your world. Maybe in your family there's only darkness. Only those who do not comprehend speak. Be bold, as the prayer said this morning. As long as you have Jesus, you have enough. Be the light. Be the light in whatever community God has placed you so that one day when darkness is banished forever, you can celebrate with all those who have loved the light. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its promise. Thank you for the Lord. Thank you for his calling us. Thank you for his 
granting us light that we might see. Thank you for being a light to us. Father, enable us to walk in the light as he is in the light that one day we might dwell with him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand and we'll praise our Lord. Well, this was a difficult sermon for me to sit through. About ten times I wanted to just jump out of my seat and yell hallelujah. My favorite book of the Bible is the Gospel of John, and my favorite portion of, of the Gospel of John is these first few verses here. In the beginning was the Word. How I love that our story begins with God, dear friends. In the beginning was the Word. What can an atheist say? In the beginning were the particles. Right? I mean, what else have they got? They don't even have that because before creation, friends, there was nothing. Nothing. You know what nothing is? Nothing is what rocks dream about. All right? There was nothing before creation. All of time, all of space, all of matter were created when God breathed it into existence. Hallelujah. One more thing I love about this first portion of John, I'll, I'll leave it at this. The verse says, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And right after that, it's as though John said in parentheses, Now wait a minute, lest you get confused about what I mean by God, here's what I mean. He was in the beginning with God, and everything was created through Him. Him. Oh, that God, the one who created everything. Not some minor or lesser God, not some created being. It doesn't say that all other things were created through him, does it? No, no. It says all things were created through him. That precludes the possibility of Jesus being a created thing. Hallelujah. So let's give thanks to the God of all creation, to the one to whom we owe our lives, our very being, our existence in this universe and the universe itself. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, oh, oh. For he is good, I give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, his love endures forever. Let's do that part again. Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, I give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, his love endures forever. His love will reign forever. His power will reign forever. His grace will reign forever. His peace will reign forever. His love will reign forever. His power will reign forever. His grace will reign forever. His peace will reign forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, oh, for he is good. His love endures forever. His love will reign forever. His power will reign forever. His grace will reign forever. His peace will reign forevermore. His love will reign forevermore. His power will reign forevermore. His grace will reign forevermore. His peace will reign forevermore. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord. 
for he is good his love endures for Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you, you've given us and all that you continue to give us. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. You are the one who was worthy of all of our highest praise, of all of our thanks. Father, hold us in the palm of your hand until we meet again. Keep us all safe and well. And bless each one of us, Lord, with a desire to know you more and to make you known. And then all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, dear friends. Why don't you come on back and have a cup of coffee and a snack in the fellowship hall? <laughs>